thankful for that. Um, continue to pray, of course, for uh, those that have lost loved ones recently. We know multiple families uh, in our even small circles uh, that have lost loved ones recently, so continue to pray for those families. Uh, also, we did get, like I mentioned this morning, we got the bags in, we've got the book of John, we've got the pens, we've got some labels, um, so we need to be looking for ways and places to be able to hand those out. So. Uh, if you see an opportunity, uh, we'll probably make a few up and have them around. That way, uh, if you guys want to take some and you just happen to have an opportunity to hand them out, you can. But we also need to be looking for an organized uh, way to get some of those things out. Um, we also haven't done any mailers in a little while, so we might want to be thinking about that pretty soon. Uh, the one thing I did want to mention, um, the, the building here is being sold to a different landlord uh, so there's some paperwork that we need to sign uh, to just confirm what we're currently paying and that that yes is what our lease is um, I have held off signing that because the wall and the noise has still not been fixed um, so I've been talking to the landlord about that um, I had told him that uh, I did not want our neighbor to have to bear the full cost of that if the landlord wouldn't pay for it I did not want our neighbor to have to bear the full cost and that uh, we would be interested in uh, sharing the cost in that. Um, uh, the neighbor has agreed that they would like to share the cost and the landlord has agreed they won't pay any of it. Um, so just continue to pray for that situation. Um, I, wanna, I wanna be the right heart and the right attitude. Um, and then, um, but I do want to be a help. I do not want this to be bore by our neighbors. Um, we're as loud to them as they are to us, and so I do not want them to have to bear that cost. There are two different bids that have been given. Um, the bid that was originally given next door, uh, I happen to know that just because I asked when it originally happened, uh, was about $4,200. The bid I got from the landlord after offering to split the cost was $9,500. Um, so we are working that detail out uh, as we proceed. Uh, apparently there were two different bids depending on how advanced you want the soundproofing. Um, and so the $9,500 I think was at one of the other facilities. I'm guessing the axe throwing place upstairs um, because he said it was a similar type situation with the types of noise. Uh, so there's a couple different bids floating around. Um, I'm supposed to call and talk to them on Monday uh, to work out some specifics and some details there. So just pray for me. I want to again, uh, I want to be, I want to be a good steward of the finances that we have and the, what the Lord has provided for us. I want to be a good neighbor. Um, I also want to be a good tenant. Uh, and so just pray that I would have the right heart and attitude uh, in all of that. And the Lord will bless. If we step out and do the right thing, the Lord's going to bless and take care of it, right? So, um, but let's be praying about that. Uh, it is good to see a little bit of movement on it. Um, and I think that's a good thing. So we'll keep, uh, we'll keep talking about those things as well. All right. Um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we get started this morning. We've got those things to think about, the families that are in need. I know Independence has some big decisions in front of them right now. So let's just go ahead and start this morning uh, with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Uh, Lord, you are abundantly gracious and merciful. And Lord, in our lives, we deserve uh, nothing but, but judgment and condemnation. Uh, Lord, but you came and you died for us and you rose again and you've, uh, Lord, paid for our sins. You redeemed us, uh, Lord, but even in that, you didn't just redeem us and leave us, that you promised to be with us. You promised to bring peace uh, and comfort to us even in times of trouble. And, uh, Lord, that you promised that one day we would stand uh, with you and we would, uh, Lord, spend an eternity in, in your presence. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, we do ask that you might be with these things that are on our hearts and our minds. Uh, Lord, we want to uh, be an example to everybody around us. Uh, Lord, the, the, the owners of the property, the, the neighbors that we have, the community. Uh, Lord, we want to be a witness. We want to be an example. We want to have that right heart and attitude. And that in the things that we do, uh, Lord, that it would reflect uh, well on you and that you might receive glory and honor through it. 
Lord, we ask that you might be with independents, uh, Lord, in the decisions that are before them. We're thankful, uh, Lord, for that church, and we ask you might just continue to help them and encourage them and bless them, give them wisdom uh, in the things that they have before them. And, uh, Lord, we do, uh, again, think about those families that have lost loved ones. And, Lord, we ask that you might just lift them up and give them grace and peace and comfort. Lord, we do ask you might be with the services today. Lord, as we go through some of this uh, items about your uh, finishing up the, the conversation about your death and your uh, burial and, and getting into some of your resurrection, uh, Lord, we want to think back on the things that you've done for us and just, uh, Lord, we want to praise you for it. We want to learn more about it. And Lord, we want to, uh, Lord, just uh, take these things and remind be reminded of how much we need to be going out and telling others about what you've done for us. And our desire, Lord, is to see lost sinners saved. And we ask you might just move in those hearts and that you might uh, save sinners. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have been in the book of John, of course. We're in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, although uh, today, or at least this morning, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, in John, uh, there's uh, a few verses we want to read, and then we want to kind of go back and talk a little bit about what is meant by this statement in John chapter 19, where the Lord, at the end uh, of his time on the cross, utters this phrase, it is finished. And we want to talk about that for just a little bit. We'll also uh, today get into a little bit about his burial and talk about some of those things as well. So, uh, again, just as a quick recap, for those that may be watching uh, online or those that have not uh, been here through the series, we have been going chapter by chapter through the book of John, and we see that uh, John really, there's some interesting things about the book of John. John actually doesn't really say that much about Christ's early life. Uh, John kind of picks up at this point where John the Baptist is going through his ministry uh, and he's talking about uh, the one that's going to come, right? Which is a, a direct fulfillment of prophecy about the one that would come and would declare and prepare the way. And so we see that in John. In the first 12 chapters of the book of John, as we've talked about before, they are very much focused on the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ with a primary focus uh, about who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. He is the one that would come all the way from saying he was the, he, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John the Baptist declaring, Behold the Lamb of God, the mighty works that the Lord Jesus Christ did, uh, the teachings that the Lord Jesus Christ did, all of those things through those first 12 chapters are really shouting out, This is the Son of God that you're about to hang on a cross and crucify, by the way. But this is the Son of God. He, fit, he fits all of the criteria. He's, he has got all the authority. This is Him. And then again, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 really deal with that personal conversation that the Lord Jesus Christ has with His disciples in the few hours leading up to His betrayal and he talks to them about the love that he has for them the love that they should have for him and the relationship they should have with each other and then in chapter 17 he gets into this prayer about you and me and the disciples and he talks about all of those things I so I find it so amazing in John chapter 17 that while he was standing here on this earth the Lord Jesus Christ prayed for me he said, not just these, but those that will believe. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. And then, of course, we see as we get into John chapter 18 and John chapter 19, we saw all of these things that Christ said would happen, happen. Judas betrayed him, one of the ones that sat closest to him, which, again, was a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. You saw Peter deny him, just like the Lord Jesus Christ said that he would. You saw the rest of the apostles abandon him and leave him, and then he went willingly, right? They could have fought. Peter tried, lopped off an ear, put it, Jesus Christ put it back on, said, nope, we're not going to do it that way. 
Jesus Christ went willingly to the cross. He willingly let them mock him. We saw them beaten, a crown of thorns put on his head, false accusations against him. Pilate wanted to let him go, but instead uh, they let the murderer, the thief, the renegade go, and they kept the Lord Jesus Christ, and they crucified him. After they had put a robe on him and mocked him, and then we saw that he was hanging on the cross in great suffering and agony, not just physically, but spiritually. He was bearing our sins. We can only fathom, we can really only fathom the physical suffering that he was going through. But the physical suffering, in all honesty, was probably the lesser of the things that he was going through. He was paying for and bearing the price of your sin, of my sin, on the cross. Those are all of the things that we've seen up to this point. And the Lord Jesus Christ did all of that willingly. He told his own disciples, I could call down legions of angels. And we talked about this a few Sundays ago. A single angel could kill 100,000 people in a few hours. Imagine what a legion of angels could do. It could wipe out the entire planet. And by the way, I can tell you from some things I read in Revelations, the Lord does not need a legion of angels to do any of that. When He comes, when He comes later, right, He's going to come and He's going to have this army with Him, but He doesn't need them. The Lord Jesus Christ did all of this stuff that we've talked about willingly and He let it happen. Did you know that that is also a fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture? Time and time and time again, John, in his gospel, he may leave out some stuff other gospels talk about. He may pick up some things that other gospels don't talk about. But time and time and time again, you see the Apostle John pointing back saying, See, he's a fulfillment of that. See, he's a fulfillment of that. Look, this is what... This is what was going to happen, and this is exactly what happened. Time and time again, even in his crucifixion account, we talked about last time where John, you don't see the conversion of the thief on the cross. You don't see some of the other things that the other Gospels talk about. But what you do see at least three times, if not four times, Christ did this to fulfill this scripture. Christ did this to fulfill this scripture. Christ did this to fulfill that scripture. John's focus is just what John's focus has been through the entire book. Behold the Son of God. This is him. And as we talked about last time, we kind of came down and we talked about how that even hanging on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was fulfilling uh, fulfilling. What he should be as a, as, a, as, a, as a godly man, he was taking care of his mother. John, he, he looked, I believe it was John, he looked at John, he said, behold your mother. He looked at his mother and said, behold your son. And then he said, I thirst. Fulfilled another part of the scripture. Took the vinegar. And in verse 30, which is where we picked up, it says, When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You see here in this story of a very intentional thing. Everything Christ has done, all the way down to picking up that ear and putting it back on that guy and telling Peter to put his sword back up. I don't want that. That's not the plan. Peter, you need to understand, this is supposed to happen. All the way down to, I thirst. Take the vinegar. I've done everything. I've fulfilled it all. It's finished. Even down to this phrase of he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Luke tells us that he actually said, Father, into thy hands commend. It was a very intentional, willingly giving up of that ghost. No one took it from him. He willingly 
gave it up. Now I'm going to read a few verses here. We won't, we're going to really focus on verse 30, but just to kind of give you a, a, a few other references, we'll probably get into these this afternoon. Verse 31, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight. And then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never a man yet laid. And there laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And as you finish out chapter 19, you see Jesus Christ declare, It is finished, and he gave up the ghost. And we find as we read this passage and we read some other passages uh, that this Joseph of Arimathea begs the body of Jesus. Uh, you find that they go out to see if, if, the, if, the, if they don't want these people hanging on the cross beyond a certain time. And so they're going to break bones and they're going to finish the job. But Jesus Christ at that point, he's already dead. And you see that idea of stabbing him with a spear. And again, this idea, just like John has done over and over again, that's an Old Testament reference. That's an Old Testament reference. And you see that all the way down even to this Joseph of Arimathea being the one that takes and buries him. And later, I don't know if we'll get to it this morning or this afternoon, but you're going to see that even the fact that it was a rich man that took and buried him, that in and of itself is also a fulfillment of some scripture. There's just so much when you look at the Old Testament that points back to Jesus Christ and what he's going to do and who he was and the things that he was going to fulfill. And it's just really neat when you start to get into all of those places. We talked even last time, the one that really amazes me, when we talked, I think it was last Sunday, when he's hanging on the cross and the rulers are mocking him and wagging their fingers at him and basically saying, you know, you... You, you saved others, can you save yourself? Or they said, well, maybe he should ask God to save him because, you know, he claimed all of this stuff. The things they said was a direct fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. Psalms literally says, while they're mocking him, they're going to say this. And then it quotes almost exactly what they said when he was hanging on the cross. There is no doubt they just crucified the Son of God. Even the Roman centurion in some of the other Gospels, you read that whenever Jesus Christ was dying, he said, whoa, this must have been the Son of God. There's no doubt uh, who has just been crucified. But I want to think about this. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and he uttered these words, it is finished. It... I couldn't help but think as I read those words this time a couple things. <laughs> God's timing versus ours. Because when Jesus Christ says it is finished, I believe that he's saying the lamb has been sacrificed. The redemption is here. The work is done. I know he still had to be... He, he was going to raise from the dead three days later... Uh, th that had its own significance and its own thing to show that he had power even over death and he had conquered those things as well. But listen to me. 
your sins, to be atoned, to be redeemed, you needed the shed blood of the perfect Lamb of God. And Jesus Christ on the cross said, it is finished. And he hung his head and he gave up the ghost. Now, I think you could wrap multiple things in that. All of the things he needed to fulfill in order to do it, it is finished. I think you could also say that the work that he needed to do to redeem you and me, it is finished. He's done it. Nobody has to go back and do it again. They don't have to keep sacrificing lambs as that picture. It's done. I have given myself. I have fulfilled the law perfectly. I have fulfilled every promise that needed to be fulfilled to show that I am who I say I am. It gave up the ghost. Now as you think about God's timing, I want you to turn back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. People that diagram the Bible and they divide it out into topics and stuff like that, you know how they would define Genesis chapter 3? Two simple words, the fall. The fall of mankind, the fall of man into sin. This, of course, is in John chapter 3 where we see in verse 1 the serpent was more subtle subtle than any beast of the field. We see that he came and he talked to the woman. We see that the woman went to the man and we see that they willingly disobeyed God. Now they each had their own excuse. The man's excuse was, well, the woman that you gave me. Now I would ask Adam, did God tell you not to partake of that tree? Yes, right? Adam may have had his excuse, but Adam disobeyed God. Adam sinned. The woman said, well, the serpent, by the way, the serpent that, you know, you created everything, right, God? The serpent made me do it. You see all of that in Genesis chapter 3. But I want you to read these words here. In verse 10 it says, and he said, I heard the voice uh, verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now you can look at this verse, and you can talk about the physical practicalities of of, of the serpent and crawling on its belly and it biting us and us stomping on its head. But this is actually a direct reference to the seed of the woman and how the serpent would try to bruise his heel, but the one that would bruise the head of the serpent, right? It's talking about the coming promise. This is about the promised seed. When Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross and he says, it is finished. Think about the timing of that. Way back in Genesis chapter 3, when the only humans in this world were Adam and Eve, and they had just sinned and, and disobeyed the word of God, and they were given this statement about the promised seed. They were given, uh, all, you could talk about some of the symbology about how that the, the animals had to pay that their sins might be covered, right? They were naked Skins were made that they might be covered. There's lots of pictures in Genesis about the coming Messiah. Jesus Christ hanging on the, word, on the cross, uttering these few words, it is finished. He has just paid for your and my sins with his life on the cross. A fulfillment of a promise like 4,000 years old. 
Now we can sit here and talk about the, the timing of God versus our timing, right? You think about Abraham. If you would, turn over to Genesis chapter 22. Verse 18, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And in Galatians chapter 3, I think it's verse 16, you see the reference to Christ being that promised seed to Abraham. So in Genesis, he tells Adam and Eve, he tells the serpent, that there's going to be this one that comes from the seed of the woman. In Abraham, he says, there's going to be one that comes from from your seed and through him all nations of the earth will be blessed and again you can think well well that that means just the genie that just, that's just talking about the all of the children of Abraham okay so there might be some reference to the the Jewish people being a blessing to the world but let me tell you what Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 makes it really clear it doesn't say seeds, it says seed, and it is specifically talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, when he says it is finished, he has just done the work that fulfills the promise to Abraham. Abraham, through your seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. You start to see as time progresses and you see Peter preach to Cornelius and you see the Apostle Paul and Silas and Barnabas and those guys go out and they start to preach to the Gentiles and Brother Philip talked about that wall of partition in Sunday school being tore down and now even the Gentiles have this path. Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross saying it is finished. He had just done the work that was necessary for this fulfillment of the pro promise to Abraham about how his seed would be a blessing to all nations. There is not a nation on this earth that does not have access to the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that all nations, all tongues, there will be those from all nations and all tongues that will be redeemed. So it may be just a few simple words hanging on the cross. It is finished. But man, he just wrapped up a 4,000 year old promise. He wrapped up a promise that was given to Abraham a few thousand years ago. And everything along the way, whether it was in Psalms, whether it was in the law, whether it was in the prophets, he has done it. And it's paid. It's done. I wouldn't come along for 2,000 years <laughs> after this event. And yes, the Lord would work in my heart. The Lord would quicken me. I would repent and trust and believe in him. But when the Lord Jesus Christ gave up the ghost on the cross and he said, it is finished, the work for my redemption was done. When he had me in mind, there was nothing that was going to change the fact that 2,000 years later he was going to move in my heart and save my soul. The redemption, the work of redemption, the work that he needed to do, it was done. It is finished. I think about what happened in the picture that we see um, back in Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein... They shall eat, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. 
his head and his legs and the, uh, the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let none of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, and with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That right there, you say, well, why are you reading that? When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he gave up his ghost and he said it is finished, he was fulfilling the picture that we have right here. For thousands of years, there had been this thing of needing to take of the Passover and to shed the blood of the lamb and to put it on the doorposts. Now that didn't save anybody, but it was a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do to save us from coming judgment. That night, that was going to pass over, and anybody not covered by the blood was going to suffer persecution, was going to suffer greatly. But the blood of the Lamb covered them. When the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and he said, it is finished. He fulfilled this right here. He said all those years of showing that picture, all of those years of needing to be reminded of what I was going to do for you, now I've done it. It's done. I finished the work. You can look in Hebrews chapter 2. It's really Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, but I'm going to read the whole thing. It says in verse 1, oh, I'm in the right chapter. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But, in one, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the Son of God that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and it has set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he hath left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by, him, by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them, which who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, whereof in all things it behooved him to be made like unto us, 
his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. I read a lot here, but you read a few different places in verse like in verse 14 where it says that he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You also read in verse 16, for verily he took on him the nature, not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and humbled himself, made himself lower than the angels, took on him the form of Abraham, of Abraham's seed, and then willingly died on the cross. And when he uttered those words, it is finished, he fulfilled his promise to Adam and Eve. He fulfilled the judgment that was to come. He fulfilled that act that needed to happen to redeem you and me. He fulfilled the promise to Abraham that one would come in his seed. He fulfilled the picture of the Passover lamb. And he died to show that he had conquered all things, even the devil. Now we know and this, this is really getting outside of the realm of the topic that we're talking about, from the point of him hanging on the cross and it is finished, then taking him down and then burying him, we know that he was in the grave for three days, but then he rose again, right? Well, not only did he give himself willingly to die on the cross, not only did he fulfill all of these things that are spoken of, but he took his own life back to prove and to show that death had no hold on him. It is finished. It's such a simple statement. It's such a small phrase. Few words, it is finished. But what powerful statements really when you think about it. You lost your sins, sinful condition, nothing you can do to fix it, nothing you can do to make yourself better, nothing you can do to cover the sins that you've already done bound for an eternity in suffering and shame and torments away from the redeeming love of God, redeeming perfect love of God. But when he hung on the cross and he took your sins and my sins upon him and he paid for our sins and he uttered that phrase, it is finished, it's done. All of this stuff in the book of John, where you see, uh, and Brother Philip talked about this here a while back in one of his lessons, you see all these times where Satan tried to interfere. Well, well let's get David. Let's get Abraham. Well, let's get this. Let's, let's stop it here. Let's tempt Jesus himself. If I can just get him to break the law in some form, if I can just get him to show he doesn't have faith in the Father, all of these times, all along the way, trying to put roadblocks in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of those things that even the, the, the Jewish leaders did, where they, they did the trial by night, they tried to, they got one of his own apostles to betray him. All of these things that they did, they didn't realize that they were just fulfilling Scripture. They were just fulfilling the plan of God. All of those times that there was this attempt to keep this promise from occurring. And yet in those three simple words, it is finished. It's done. Your sins have been paid for. I paid for them. I'm done. There's nothing that can change it. It's finished. That promise to Adam and Eve, that promise to Abraham, I could have went and talked about the promise to David. All of these things, it's done. The veil, if we'd read some of the other Gospels, we'd learn that the veil of the temple was rent. You know, honestly, at that point in time, there was never a need for the high priest to go sprinkle the blood anymore. It was done. That picture had been fulfilled. 
When Jesus Christ says it is finished, I'd like to sit here and tell you, well, he was just saying that it was done and he was dying. Man, there's so much more wrapped up in that. And I'm not even hitting all of it. All of those pictures, even the one in earlier in John, right? The Son of Man must be lifted up. Just like what? Just like they lifted up the brazen serpent? That was going to be a picture of what was to come. Picture after picture of the Messiah has just been fulfilled as he is uttering those final words and giving up his life on the cross. It is finished. Your sins were paid for when Christ died on the cross. It's done. Now this afternoon, what we'll get into a little bit, um, again, I, you start in this path, you start down this thing, and there's just so much in here, and I don't ever make it as far as I plan to make it. But um, this afternoon, uh, we'll pick up a little bit, and we'll actually talk about the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, we want to go back and take a look at one chapter uh, in the Old Testament, and we want to focus on that chapter a little bit um, because I think as we've come down to the end of John and we've seen so much, while it's fresh on our mind and, and we've, we've talked about all this stuff in the book of John, I want to go back and I want to read one chapter in the Old Testament. And I want you, as we think about that chapter this afternoon, I want you to think about what all we've covered in the book of John and you just start to check off in your mind how much the Lord Jesus Christ uh, has fulfilled that chapter, okay? And I'm not going to tell you what it is. Some of you might be guessing already. Uh, there's several of them I could go to, but there's one in particular that I want to cover. So let's go ahead and be dismissed this morning. Uh, if we have Brother Philip come and uh, lead us in a song of invitation, uh, continue to pray for me as I, uh, as I preach. I want to be a blessing. I want to be an encouragement. I want to be open to whatever the Lord has for me to bring. We're coming down to the end of John. Uh, we've got a little bit more. It's going to take us some time to get through it. But be praying for me. I want to bring, uh, continue to bring uh, lessons that will be an encouragement and help us as we grow together. All right, let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Number three.